Welcome to Microsoft Build 2017. We're here to talk about designing mobile applications. My name is David Ortnow. I'm a senior program manager with the Mobile Dev Tools team and Xamarin Forms. Uh, just a little bit about me. I've been doing mobile and web development uh, now going on 20 years using a variety of platforms, but my heart and my love is Xamarin. And what I love about it more than anything is what it allows me to do from a design standpoint, to be faithful uh, to each platform to make sure that I'm delivering the best experience possible. So what I want to say first of all to you, uh, you, maybe you're coming from a web standpoint, maybe you're coming from a desktop development standpoint or a design standpoint, um, but what is really important is that we are all designers. We all have a role to play in the design of our applications. So whether you are involved at the very beginning, building the, I, the UI, uh, determining what the, the experience is going to be, or you're implementing that design, we're making design decisions all along the way. So if we understand and we can internalize the important aspects of design and what makes a really good design as opposed to a design that's going to cause frustration and anguish, uh, we will deliver better. So let's talk about the first thing that I, that I like to do is conducting user testing. So uh, perhaps you have a lab uh, or you think of this as something more that a research person does, but this is something that we can do even informally. So here's my quick guide to providing real quick basic user testing. Provide as little context and direction as needed. Grab somebody at the coffee shop or uh, wherever, you know, somebody, buy them a cup of coffee, say, hey, I'm testing out a, a mobile app, will you help me out? Sit them down and give them just the basics. Don't give them too much information because if you do, you'll end up priming them. You'll end up giving them too much information and they'll just regurgitate it back to you. And then encourage them as they explore the app or they explore the activity that you've given them guidance for, they will uh, encourage them to verbalize what's going on through their head. Um, have them say, you know, hey, I'm, I'm using the app and I'm looking for what to do and maybe I'm getting lost uh, or, oh, well, that's, that's pretty cool and you'll start to get some really good feedback there. And then listen, watch, and observe. Just sit back and let them go about doing what it is that they're doing. So a really quick example from my personal experience, I was designing an app. Uh, it was something that I, it was near and dear to my heart and I thought that I had nailed the design. So I met a friend at Starbucks and I put the app in front of her and I gave her the basics. Here's kind of what the app does. What do you think? And I gave her those steps and she started going about it and she got to one of the screens where she was adding a goal to the app. And she started exploring it and she says, huh, okay, um, I don't know where to go next. Uh, I'm kind of lost. So I had to give her some, a nudge. And so that told me that perhaps there was something I could do to improve that workflow. And then as she got to the next screen and the next screen, suddenly she was saying, oh wow, that's really cool. I hadn't thought of it that way. So I realized there was an opportunity to delight my user at that point. And it just created such a deeper understanding for me about what worked and what didn't work in the application. Uh, and I was able to go back, revamp the design, and come out with something even better. So as you can, doesn't have to be a big deal, conduct user testing. It can be totally informal. If you can go the whole formal route, do it in a lab, have it recorded and all that, that's awesome as well. Principle number two, one thing per screen. So what this means is, uh, on, uh, for example, on the left-hand side, we've got a sign-in screen. It does really the one thing. Um, so it, there should be no confusion. When the user gets to the screen, it's clear what they're going to do. And if they don't know what to do, they've got the uh, register button, the sign-up button below it. Um, if they've forgotten, the secondary actions are there, but the primary action, the primary purpose for that screen, completely clear. Uh, the sessions list, and this is the Xamarin Evolve 2016 app that I'm using here for an example. Um, and you can grab any, any app that you open up on your phone and ask yourself, what is the one thing that this screen is doing? Especially the apps that work really well for you. And then, uh, so the session screen, the primary function of that session screen is to provide a list of sessions. And of course, the primary action is going to be searching. But we also have secondary actions. So it's not that the screen can't do more than one thing, but... Uh, the one thing should be obvious. And then the session details screen, the primary thing there is obviously telling you the details about the session, which it does, but the primary action at this point is to rate that session. And uh, of course you're saying, well, why would I rate the session? I haven't watched the session yet. But uh, that's because the session already happened. So the only thing you can do is rate it. 
So let's talk navigation. So when it comes to navigation, each platform kind of has its own navigation scheme uh, or patterns that are more coherent on that platform that are expected. So iOS, of course, has the tab bar at the bottom. Um, UWP and Android both kind of uh, gravitate towards flyout or master detail menus. So understanding and knowing what those navigation patterns are is helpful for us to know how to uh, let users navigate. Now, uh, remember that UWP and Android both have back buttons on their devices. So that means that, that having that notion on the device impacts what navigation you're going to use on, the, on, the, on your UI. Um, iOS, on the other hand, uh, has this swipe to go back that they introduced. So that's something to be aware of also. Let's talk a moment about accessibility. So highly important, especially at Microsoft, we certainly beat this drum, we believe this is important, that uh, users need to be able to see uh, the text on the screen. They, if they have a, an impairment that requires having the voiceover turned on, that we have as developers turned on the uh, naming and the description so that we get those things read back to us. Um, and then also making sure that your contrast is good. Um, these are all simple things to test and user testing goes a long way to telling you if you're doing well in those cases. So on the screen here you see, I'll go back and forth a couple of times, that the text is small and then when we have enabled units of measure that are device independent or density independent, then as the user changes their accessibility settings, you'll get larger text as appropriate. Xamarin Forms, by the way, gives this to you pretty much for free um, because it uses, uh, rather than fixed dimensions and un units of measure, it uses a unit of measure that is then translated down to each platform. Okay, designing for touch. Obviously, this is a, a mobile focused design talk, so we want to talk about what's important for touch. People hold their devices in different ways. A lot of research has been done on this. One-handed, 49% of people use it that way. Cradled, that would be with one hand here and then the other hand touching it. Or two-handed, especially in the case of a tablet, but that may not be always at the bottom of the screen, it might be middle of the screen. And that impacts where you can reach parts of that UI. So the green in this example refers to the yes area. This is where you can easily access and easily touch things on that screen, especially in this one-handed position. Then the next area is, eh, it's okay. You can kind of touch it. Um, you can get to it if you need to, but it's really not a stretch. And then of course you've got that far corner up there that unless you have really big hands and a really small device is gonna be problematic for you to reach. And if you think about this in terms of where the UI elements exist on the devices and in the applications that you're using, uh, you'll find that the things that are least accessed, that hamburger menu option, for example, on a flyout UI, it is going to be uh, not as easily accessible, but you can still get to it when you need to get to it. And then, of course, iOS at one point introduced that double tap or triple tap of the home button, however you have it set up, that brings the UI down so that you can see it. Um, that was one way of achieving some, some help there. But Stephen Huber, I'll just mention, it has done some research and there's a great book, Designing uh, Mobile Interfaces, that has some really good information about this sort of thing. And of course, if you're left-handed, just reverse that. And if you're two-handed, you can kind of think of it that way. So when you're placing your UI elements, consider where you're putting things. Uh, the other thing to consider when it comes to touch is the size of your buttons. If you have really small text that's supposed to be touchable and takes action, or you have buttons and they're too small or they're too close to something else, it becomes very difficult for people to use those buttons. And then, I mean, we've all experienced the frustration of trying to hit that button and you, you missed it. You hit the thing next to it and now you're super frustrated and angry and you're yelling at the developer that made it. Um, so a good rule of thumb, 40 pixels uh, and then a five pixel margin between that element and something else. But as we know, devices nowadays have multiple densities, which means that 40 pixels on one device is not 40 pixels on another device from a physical measuring sense, right? So what does pixels really mean anymore? So Apple and Android and Universal Windows Platform, Microsoft, everybody's come up with a different way to express units of measure that is independent of device and independent of density of screen. So Apple, they use what's called the point, Android has density independent pixels, or what's commonly referred to as DIPs or DPs. 
and then UWP uses device-independent pixels. And again, this is something that Xamarin Forms does a nice job of abstracting away for you so that you can express your units of measure once and it gets translated to that platform so it scales appropriately. But when it comes to making assets for our devices and for our applications, notice this grid on the right here. That's a lot of things that need to be created. That represents all the different sizes for all the different densities, or at least most of them, that you need to create copies of each image to be ready for each of those platforms at those scales, at those resolutions. That's a problem, right? So pixels really, although we still make our images and our assets at a pixel size, uh, it's not rendering at that size, and that's a lot of artwork to create. So how do we address this? We design with vector graphics. So this is a picture right here of the Sketch app, which is one of my favorites on the Mac side, and there are other options on the Windows side. Sketch is not one that's available there. But at its core, it is a vector drawing application, and this one in particular is geared towards mobile and web applications. So what that allows us to do is to create uh, high fidelity prototypes as well as production ready art. And then when it comes time to produce those art pieces, all those images that we saw on that previous screen at all those different sizes, we can do a vector export from Sketch. And again, other applications have other ways of doing this that, are, that is also powerful. And then it all at once gives us all the sizes we need. For more information about this, check out my Xamarin Evolve 2016 session. It's a little shameless plug here on the design to development workflow where I cover that tool as well as many other tools that we've been really successful with uh, in building mobile applications. So let's talk about designing for context. Now what do we mean by this? I mean if you're in the desert on a hike, who wouldn't want to be? If you're on the subway, a lot of us have to do that. Uh, or if you're at home on the couch, those are different uh, places in which we're using our mobile applications. So consider if you're out on a hike, what features might be important to you? Offline, clearly, is going to be an issue by the pyramids. I don't know. I haven't been there, but there may not be a cell tower nearby. Um, so you're going to want to make sure that your application, if the user is expected to use that application in that environment, has good offline functionality. Nothing worse than opening up the app and having it say, oh, sorry, you're offline, no can do uh, Offline, online sync, of course. If you are working offline, once you do come back online, you want to make sure that you can sync. And then location services, of course, mapping, maybe voice. All of these things are available to you in that environment. But if you're on a subway, which subway is notoriously loud, uh, you need to hold on to something. So certainly one-handed use is a priority. Privacy, you don't want somebody looking over your shoulder while they're using the application. Or maybe it doesn't matter for your application, but if it does, that's something to consider. And it's noisy. If your application depends on voice recognition, that is not a good choice if it's going to be used on a subway. So you might want to have a backup plan for that. And then, of course, Wi-Fi versus cellular. Are you being respectful of the user's data charges? And if you're like me and you're sitting at home on the couch and you're watching TV, does your app interface with things that are happening on the TV? Uh, perhaps it's a gaming application or a game and uh, you want to be able to do one thing on your phone and another thing on the TV and have them work together. Uh, are you doing Bluetooth? Are you integrating? How are you integrating? These are all things to consider from a design standpoint to make your app really stand apart from the competition. But one thing that's very interesting that's come up recently in studies over the last several years is that people don't use just one device. And not only do they not use just one device, but they often will use that device and another device concurrently or they will use them sequentially. They'll start an activity on one device and then they'll move to other devices. So for uh, the recent study, and this is a uh, Google study from a marketing uh, research project they did, 57% of people use multiple devices, 21% concurrently. But the key is, uh, one, one of the emphasis is from that research found that it's still mobile first. And uh, some excellent examples of activities that people will do from one device to another device shopping, video streaming, gaming. So if your application is going to be used on multiple devices, consider how you're going to handle that. Online, offline sync. Azure has excellent services, and I've used the mobile services package from them to do that. RealmDB also now works with Azure to do online, offline sync, which is very cool. So those are some excellent things to look at from a development standpoint. But from a design standpoint, consider 
what are you doing to support those types of activities? And are you being consistent not only with your design and your brand, but your functionality across those? Okay, a, a word about affordance. Affordance is one of my favorite words, and I don't think it's one that we talk about near enough. But it's the perceived signal or clue that an object may be used to perform a particular action. So uh, a door has a handle on it or a push, and it will tell you how to use that door. Unless it's not done properly, and we've all seen this happen, you walk up to the door and you go to push when you should pull, and you run your face into it, and it's super embarrassing, and we don't want to have people doing that with our mobile apps. So we want to properly use affordance. So here are several different types of affordance. We have explicit affordance, which is push me. Um, and on iOS, you may have seen this in applications lately. They don't necessarily have a background to the button or even an outline to the button. It's just text. So having an explicit call to action is important for that. Patterns. If you have a grouping of text that's at the top or at the bottom of a screen and it's broken up, it's clearly not a sentence, more than likely it's a menu. And that's a common pattern. We see that in web design a lot. Um, that people understand and that pattern is something they can follow. It, it's a call to action. Metaphors. So uh, these are icons that are commonly understood either through repetitive use or uh, you know, we've given them that meaning, we've imbued that meaning upon them, or they're real world meanings that are brought into the digital space. We clearly understand that trash is going to delete something, plus is going to add something, etc. And then we've got login that's a negative affordance. And essentially what a negative affordance is saying is that you can't do anything with this. We've turned it off, and until something else happens, it's not going to be enabled for action. So uh, we're all familiar, I think, most of us with that. So with that, I want to wrap up with this call to action. iOS, Android, UWP, they all have very distinct pillars of what makes their design stand out in their uh, community. People that use an iOS device expect iOS applications to behave a certain way. The same can be said for Android, Android and the same can be said for UWP applications. So follow up on these guides. Research them, understand what is important on those platforms so that as you're designing your cross-platform mobile applications, hopefully with Xamarin, uh, you will be able to have the best success possible. Thanks for joining me. I hope this was informative to you, and enjoy Microsoft Build 2017.